All right, let's go ahead and get started with our Q&A today. Uh, <clears throat> Appreciate those that have signed on and uh, we'll be uh, hopefully addressing some questions for you today that uh, you can submit this through the, uh, the Q and a button that should be available to you in your zoom um, toolbar down there. So I uh, want to thank everyone for joining in. Uh, my name is Brian Jackson. I'm the CEO and president of Avix technologies uh, with me as another panelist. I have Lee Kennedy. He serves as our service manager and, a uh, very capable and uh, smart engineer, and he's going to be helping me uh, look at and answer some questions that uh, have been submitted and some that we have uh, that you can submit. So, And hopefully uh, you and your families are doing well during uh, the uh, quarantine time and everybody's staying healthy and, uh, and uh, staying well, and hopefully business is uh, going as well as it should be right now during these uh, – I would say trying and challenging times. So, um, so we'll go and get started today. Uh, and as anybody wants to go ahead and start putting some questions in the queue, you can do that. Uh, and then uh, we'll uh, start uh, start the session here in just a second. Let's see here. All right, a couple of questions to get us started today. This this has got a couple of good ones here. Let's see here. Um, pretty general question, Lee. Let's just hit this one first. Um, top cyber security concerns of the business today. What are your thoughts on that? You got anything to add? What are what are what are some of the top ones that came to your mind when you think of security concerns? Uh, right off the bat, email. Emails are one of the biggest concerns. It's the biggest target. Everybody's after it, trying to get credentials to, you know, uh, collect as much data as they can and use you to use against you. So, you know, emails, I think, is the biggest one that comes off the top of my head. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, I, you know, statistically, 90% of uh, threats come via email. And I believe right now we're seeing – uh, even that threat go higher simply because of all the, uh, with the, the, the COVID-19, we're seeing a lot of phishing emails show up with uh, World Health Organization. We've got the SBA loan programs that are out there. Uh, so we're seeing a huge spike in those emails and, and emails related to uh, those type of uh, things that are going on right now in this environment. Um, what I also think remote access is a big one now. We've got a lot of, uh, you know, issues that people accessing information remotely. And uh, I think that's a, that's a big one uh, that everyone's facing right now, exactly how to execute on that. So I, I think those are two big ones right there. The phishing emails, that's always been a problem. But like I said, it's been, a, I think, even a bigger problem now. You want to talk about uh, real quick about some of the best practices of working from home or working remote? Yeah, I mean, actually, that that has come up, and we look at look at some of the the Q and A's that have come up. Uh, what security issues are you seeing with everyone working from home? So I think it's a great place to start. I think that's probably one of the biggest concerns we're seeing right now. Um, I think we just ought to start with um, the remote access side. Uh, you know, what are some things we can do to secure? or better secure or remote access. I think it starts with probably VPN. Uh, you know, you got to yeah. have secure access to it. Um, let's talk about that. So VPN, if you don't know what that is, is virtual private network is what that stands for. But what that does is it provides a, a secure connection between your endpoint, which is your workstation, your laptop, whatever you're using, uh, and your corporate um corporate environment or corporate servers, which could be hosted, you know, there in your premise or the cloud. And there's uh, a lot of different ways, you know, that provides security mainly is encryption uh, that, that keeps uh, anyone from sniffing the traffic between those locations. And also uh, we also want to have what's called multi-factor authentication on it. So Lee, tell, tell us about MFA, why that's so important. Sure. Multi-factor authentication uses a third party or a tool to verify that you are who you say you are. Typically, you see it through a uh, application to your phone, whether that be through an application or a text message, uh, random characters that you can put in to guarantee that that is 
you because most likely you have possession of your cell phone or that app you might be using. Yeah, so it's something you know, which would be your password, uh, in addition to something you have. Right. So, uh, you know, those are the, I think, two requirements that uh, you need to have in place to make sure that, uh, you know, your remote workforce uh, is secure as they work from home. Uh, what about patching, endpoint protection? A lot of stuff around that to talk about. Yeah, they all come and play. You know, you want a you want a secure machine, a healthy machine, a patched machine, uh, preferably a machine that's being uh, monitored by either your MSP or your local IT staff, uh, making sure they're they're following your uh, prereqs. So um, yeah, all those are considerations because once this machine connects to the VPN, theoretically they have connection to your local network. It's like somebody taking that machine putting it in your office and booting it up. So you wanna make sure that that device is clean and um, uh, you know, allowed by your uh, IT policies or followed yeah. by your IT policies. Yeah, I think one thing too, uh, you know, when we think about security in, in their office space, uh, we're under one network and you're behind a firewall. And you know, we, you know, we put a lot of uh, security around you know, the, the network and how it, it looks at traffic and control in and out. We don't really have that at home. Uh, that, that's, that's a big difference between working uh, in a corporate environment and work from home. And, uh, you know, as we see now, everyone's distributed. Your data is not just going through a single point or a single network. It's now going through almost every network that your employees are attached to. Uh, so we really have to work on wrapping security around that endpoint uh, to making sure it's got good antivirus, uh, it's good got uh, you know, any kind of a enhanced detection response capabilities and making sure it's up to date. So those are some things we're working with uh, you know, at the moment uh, with clients, uh, trying to mitigate as many security issues as possible. Uh, I think about data too. Uh, you know, all this data is now traveling outside the corporate environment, uh, outside the normal security. I think that's an important thing we need to think about too, is uh, you need to increase you need to educate your employees on how to handle that data uh, now that it may be viewed and may be accessed, transmitted outside uh, of your corporate firewall, outside of your secure corporate network. So uh, those are some things I think we're seeing security issues that uh, need to be addressed and, uh, you know, within uh, the remote work environment. Um, had one question, what does multi-factor identification apply to? That's a great question. Uh, it applies to a lot of things, um, and it's a, a very, um, almost something by default needs to be put in place if possible. So uh, we talked about in context of VPN. Lee, I know you've seen MFA use. We use it for a lot of different applications. What are some of the ones you've seen it used for? Uh, email authentication, which mm -hmm. is another big one we already kind of touched up on. Uh, applications, whether they be web-based or, you know, local to your network. Um, you name it, you can probably put MFA on there, you know, banking accounts, um, you know, I don't know, your, your Zoom account would be a good yep. one to put it on there. So it, it's all over the place and should be utilized. There's a lot of good um, uh, vendors out there that provide multi-factor authentication for all these different applications. So definitely worth looking into and worth uh, worth the investment of time and money. Yeah, I pretty much see, uh, we've seen uh, multi-factor authentication be applied to almost any kind of, of host, especially in kind of hosted service. We talk about Office 365, they include it as part of their products. We, we've helped a lot of clients roll that out. We talked about having available for VPN, very effective there. Uh, we also have seen it rolled out to different SaaS applications. So if you're using a hosted application, or software as a service, um, you need to check with your vendors, see if they offer that. Sometimes they don't offer it up front, uh, and sometimes you just need to ask them if they have it uh, available, and I would definitely uh, encourage you uh, to take advantage of that um, if, they, if they do. Uh, got a couple of, of extra questions coming in. Let's, let's sort of roll through these. Um, let's see. Okay, if I order a computer right now, I won't be here till June. What can I do to work from home? So, so what kind of Lee? What What do you think? What are the some of the best options we can we can uh, recommend if if they can't get a computer, <laughs> which is a problem for everybody right now? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, 
You know, I would say home machines could be permitted. Once again, if they meet all those specs we discussed, you know, just a few minutes yeah. ago, make sure it's patched. Make sure it's got AV up on there that's got, you know, up-to-date definitions. Um, have your IT staff or your MSP look at the machine, and they, they probably have some tools that they can load on there temporarily mm -hmm. um, to help facilitate uh, the access and the security. Um, you know, but those that's really your only options. You kind of need a computer to, to get in there, you know, tablets or iPads and stuff like that. They, they can be used, but at, at a limited um, functionality compared to having a, a flip phone PC. Yeah, I think what we saw, uh, you know, is probably the beginning of March. We saw a huge push in our client base that they were, hey, they had to move from an on-site work, work uh, you know, workforce to a remote workforce. And, uh, you know, some of them were better prepared than others for that. Uh, some of them had used a laptop. Some of them had a remote desktop set up uh, or secure remote desktop. But I think one thing we're going to see going forward uh, and, and one thing we're going to talk to clients is desktop as a service, uh, which I think is probably one of the best solutions is if you're in your business and you're saying, hey, this is this could be a more permanent solution for us uh, going forward or, you know, God forbid, this thing drags out. Uh, you know, a little bit longer, you know, I think there are some more, some better solutions out there, you know, to look at versus using your home PC, uh, maybe using a, we had several clients that's pull laptops off the shelf and just start handing them out to people. So um, I think if you, if you do have a home PC, uh, you know, make sure it's secure, make sure you've got your windows updates uh, uh, set up correctly where they're automatically installing and, and check into that. That's pretty easy to check into, uh, make sure you're accessing, uh, you know, your network using the VPN with multi-factor authentication, if that's available to you. Uh, and also I think one, one thing we haven't talked about is the human factor, uh, about having a work PC at home. Uh, I know let you're me, like, let me, let me interrupt you real quick and touch up on one thing, you know, Keep in mind, if you're running Windows 7 at home, chances yeah. are it's not up to date and it's not supported by Microsoft. So That's a great point. If you're running Windows 7, that's a red flag. You do not want to connect it uh, to your network. Yeah, I would agree. You, need, you do need to make sure that that machine is supported. Uh, we definitely have encouraged uh, you know anyone we've talked to to be You need to be running Windows 10. Uh, Windows 7 has been out of support uh, you know, for since the beginning of this year. Uh, you're not going to get security updates, any uh, any types of thing, any types of uh, vulnerabilities that exist are going to always exist for that that app for that machine. So that's a very important. You're running a more modern operating system uh, and have those security features enabled. Uh, yeah. Sorry, couple of the mean to interrupt. Oh, that's all right. No, well, this is what we're t so. Uh, one thing about. Uh, here's a good question. How about dedicated firewalls for the home office? Is that something that, that companies should be considering right now? Um, absolutely. I would consider it. I think it's a great um, tool. Usually, usually when you see that, though, it's with larger companies, just in my mm -hmm. experience. Um, if you're going to supply them with a corporate firewall, you need to supply them with the home corporate machine and possibly even supply them with the internet access that they need uh, to actually work from home. So I, I would definitely consider it, but there's, there's more to consider than just the firewall at, at hand. Yeah, I agree with that. I think if, if you have a situation where that employee is going to be more of a permanent remote work employee, then you need to look at maybe at, at putting a firewall there, you know, at their location. I do think, uh, and we've seen this, you know, come up in several conversations about, you know, putting corporate equipment, you know, in your home. Well, how does that affect the privacy of the employee? Uh, you know, a firewall is a lot more uh, restrictive. So how is that going to affect other people, you know, within that home network? Because uh, I know I have kids, you know, uh, we, we play Xbox, we watch Netflix, we, we do all those things that families do, you know, through the internet. Uh, you know, I, I do have a firewall at my house and I'll tell you, I'm, I'm constantly having to, you know, you know, allow things, disallow things, you know, it is great for my kids because I can lock it down and, and make sure we're secure and make sure they can't get to any sites, uh, that they shouldn't be at. But I do think it does bring up some questions about, uh, you know, 
privacy within the home. We, we've addressed that. Uh, you know, how firewalls may affect that home, uh, home situation, home network situation. Uh, I do agree with you, Lee, about, hey, it may be necessary to bring in a second connection in and have it just dedicated because if you're going to put a firewall in, you really need to segregate your, you need to have two separate networks at home. A yeah, network you're just using for work and one for home. And you can set up the firewall, you know, to, to have two networks on it, a home network and a per you can. for your uh, uh, corporate or corporate network or extended corporate network, if you will. So there's a lot, you, you know, you get a lot more options if you do introduce the firewall to the, to the home. Um, but there's a lot of, you know, a lot of issues with it too. Shared ISP, you're sharing bandwidth with your neighborhood, assuming you live in a neighborhood, but you're, you're sharing that bandwidth with everybody else. So there's a, there's a lot to consider of it, but that's a great thing to consider. Uh, from a security well, standpoint, absolutely. And I'll tell you, I mean, I have, you know, I, I have a, I have a firewall, I have a watch card here at the house that uh, I got through a promotion, put it in. I use it for testing and for, for learning on my own. But I'll tell you, your home network's under attack. You know, I, I, I consistently have a long list of IPs that are blocked because they're trying to do something malicious with my network. They're they're trying to scan it, trying to access it. Uh, you know, and, and some of these are, are IPs that originate in China or across across the across the world. So uh, don't think that just because you have a home network uh, that it's not being attacked because it, it most definitely is. And I think it's probably uh, being attacked more now uh, because, you know, the adversaries know uh, that everyone is working from home uh, and it, home networks are not hardened. You know, they're not made. Uh, to be secure and there's a lot of even routers out there that you know your ISP puts out that have security flaws in them we've seen that published out there as well so somebody else asked a great question I just want to go ahead and clear up while we're on the subject of home PCs they were asking about Windows 8 and is it still mm -hmm. supported? it is it is supported till 2023 so if you're running, running Windows 8 you, you should be fine so, uh, so, uh, you know, the next three years, January, 2023 is the cutoff date on that. Yeah, that's good to know. Uh, we talk about, I know how fast, uh, your internet should be or your internet provider. That, that's, uh, I think that that's really dictated by where you live. Uh, who's your provider there where you live? You're, you're down in, you're down in, I know, south of town where, who's out there with you? Uh, we got basically charter and AT&T available to us. Yeah. Which I'm on, I'm on charter, charter, and we've got a 60 meg pipe, but um, it, it does good, you know. The wife and child are streaming downstairs, and I'm, you know, obviously online also. So it really depends on what you're doing and what mm -hmm. the rest of the household is doing outside of you just working uh, to, to really answer that question. But to do work, typically, you don't need much bandwidth. Um, but typically, you're not going to be you're not going to be the only person using the internet at your, at your home. So keep yeah. that in mind. Uh, as far as the best provider, I, I don't really have a good answer to that because they all have their strength and weaknesses. I feel like we we've had good and bad dealings with all of them. I think personally, but also, you know, with advocates working with our clients and when we've got charter out here, uh, I actually started out with windstream. I live out in trustful, you know, Northeast Jefferson County, close to the St. Clair line. And we started out with windstream and, uh, it was, uh, it did not meet my needs. Uh, and we finally, after I think a year and a half, finally convinced Charter to come out here and, and they, they actually had to get a two driveways to plug it in for my house. And, and it's been good. I, I have a 30 to 40 meg connection, probably need to upgrade it, <laughs> uh, here pretty soon, but I haven't uh, really seen, uh, what's available. So there are a lot of things I think can affect your internet connectivity. I'm all actually on the end of a street near a cul-de-sac. So I'm at the very end of the line, deep in the, neighborhood so i'll probably uh have the most fragmented bandwidth uh where i'm at but uh i think the best provider the best internet connection you have i'd, I'd get as much as you can afford just depending on uh, what your budget is and what's available um also i think your provider just limited to what's in your area there's just people have more options than others i think as well uh so that that that's really dependent on where you're at location is also a big thing just as the the infrastructure provided Charter yeah. in my neighborhood might be a lot better than the infrastructure uh, charter somewhere else. So it, it's, it's really very, very true. Very, very true. Um, if you're in remote locations, uh, it's tough. 
Uh, I mean, we have run some clients recently. They're trying to do VPN over a, a very, very slow DSL connection. I think we've even told our staff to start doing just, uh, you know, internet speed tests right out of the gate, you know, when we get some problems with VPN connectivity, just to see what their bandwidth was. And I think, I, I think it's safe to say it's getting stressed right now with everybody has sort of distributed out to, you know, more of a residential networks. And uh, I think there's definitely some stress on their infrastructure as people are, are working from home. So. I've even uh, seen, you know, I've even seen internet via satellite and it is expensive and slow. So I would not. Yes. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes it's the only option some people have and they have yep. to have it. So they'll, they'll pay it, but it's, it's not, it's not great. At least it was several years ago. The last time I saw it, it ran across. It. Absolutely. Uh, I had another question about MFA about how many multi-factor phone apps out there. Why they can just text me a code. So uh we see multi-factor delivered and uh, we we sort of have that same challenge there's a lot of different uh apps out there that can do multi-factor we've used duo we use auth point through watch guard uh there's google authenticator there's a microsoft authenticator you know I, I think there's just not a lot of they all seem to use the same technology uh but it's like everybody wants an, their own app so i think i have four four apps for multi-factor on my phone uh, and uh, texting you a code, a lot of them do and will just text you a code. Uh, for the most part, that is secure, but uh, there are some uh, definite uh, things to think about. If and but that, I think it would take a more advanced attack to intercept that text code uh, that is sent to your phone. They would have to probably clone your cell phone to make that happen or to intercept that. Uh, but yeah, I, I I would love to see some consolidation of market. I mean, the technology we've set a lot of MFA up, but Lee is most of the technology is the same for it, isn't it? Same setup, more or less. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Same setup, you know, for the most part. Uh, different apps, you know, I like to use the text message thing just to kind of keep it universal uh, as, as much as I can. So I use that and, you know, duo push notifications yep. that, going to, that I try to use. They won't, you know, give me a code through duo or off point. Um, you know, send me a text message. Yeah. It just keeps, um, cut down, cuts down on the old apps that you may have to install on your phone or remember where they're at. And try to log into something. You can't remember what app you got to open to get your, you know, MFA code. Uh, text message, you know, pretty good. A good solution to, to keep it minimal. Yeah. And some of it is depending on, on who's deploying the multi-factor authentication because we have some, we run some apps that are only compatible with this provider. So hopefully we'll see some consolidation in that market and maybe, maybe a standard will be put out. We'll make it a little bit easier for everybody to use MFA. I would say, yeah, it's a little bit fragmented, but I think it is something very important for uh, use in any kind of, or accessing kind of online application. Um, I'm going to go ahead and hit the, the elephant in the room here about zoom. A <laughs> uh, lot of, a lot of press about zoom out there right now. Uh, you know, in particular, this question talks about Zoom bombing. Um, and, I'll, I'll, you know, what, what do we know about it? What is it? Uh, basically, uh, you know, Zoom bombing is actually having someone enter your Zoom meeting that's not invited. Well, you ask, well, how, they can, how can they do that? It's actually pretty simple uh, in a way. It depends on how you've got your Zoom set up. But uh, I saw a demo just the other day where, uh, you know, a throwback to the old days where somebody used what's called a war dollar. And if you, if you go back in the eighties the and you look at, uh, you know, a couple of, what was the movie called uh, war games with Matthew Broderick, he had a war dollar and that basically is just something that they kept dialing until it found the connection. They're using the same, same type of process, you know, with, uh, with zoom, that meeting number is a nine digit number and they're just trying random combinations of that nine digit number. And once they get a hit, it allows them to actually enter the meeting. So uh, there are some definite uh, changes to the configuration in Zoom that you can make uh, to keep that from happening. And uh, one is also to make sure they can only enter with the password or a passcode. So, uh, you know, Zoom is actually, you know, they're taking a lot of, a lot of hits, uh, but I think they, they've, I've been pretty satisfied with the way they've been reacting to it. They've been releasing at least several, I think I've gotten three client updates, Lee, you know, to the Zoom client we use because we use Zoom at Abacus. Yep. Um, you know, we've gotten at least three client updates that address vulnerabilities. 
Um, you know, and I, I think uh, they're they're making some progress on it. I think they they got caught off guard by the use of their platform too. And keep in mind too, whenever a tool or an application like that gets so this much attention as it has in the last three to four weeks, it's going to be a target. And they, you know, the bad guys uh-huh. are going to pick it apart. And, and keep that in mind in general about any application, you know, Facebook and Twitters or, you know, these other meeting platforms, they're all targets and they're all going to get hammered hard. So don't just pick on Zoom because they've all been in trouble as far as privacy concerns and stuff, stuff like that. Absolutely, just that yeah. The latest in the, in the spot. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. And I think, you know, we talked about this uh, a couple of weeks ago because we knew we were going to get some questions about this. But I think, you know, one of the, th- there's a couple of the different vulnerabilities that are out there. One was uh, obviously the Zoom bombing. And, and, and then we, we had a, there was a vulnerability where you could put a, uh, a UNC path or a link within the chat. And then also uh, a final one just on I'm trying to think what it was exactly. Uh, but of course, email phishing. So I think it really boils down to three things. One, you need to educate your users on how to use Zoom and how to configure it. Uh, if you can go through and make the configuration changes, and this isn't just focused on Zoom, but I think any application, any platform you may introduce as part of your work from home uh, strategy right now, and that goes for Teams, it may go for Dropbox, it may go for OneDrive, whatever you're using. I mean, all these are new to new to a lot of companies and using them. They need to, to take the time to go in and configure them correctly, make sure the settings are, are put in place to, to provide that privacy, to provide that security, because Zoom doesn't necessarily give you that out of the box. You've got to go configure it because their, their focus is to give you a working product. It's not necessarily a focus to give you uh, security. They may put the features there, but they're going to put it on you to turning on those features and, and determining how they're going to secure your business. A second thing is, as I mentioned, they've released a lot of updates for their client. Hey, keep your software up to date. Uh, that's not anything that is specific to Zoom. You know, we talk about Windows updates. There's updates for Dropbox and you know, all these, uh, you know, OneDrive. You know, there's updates always put out for those programs. Keep your, keep your applications up to date. Uh, that, that's a very big piece of staying secure, uh, whether you're in a corporate environment, in your home office, uh, very important. I think finally, can't say enough about clicking on links. Uh, you know, don't, if you don't, <laughs> I mean, if you see a link, don't click on it. Uh, I think uh, in, if you, especially if you're at all suspicious about it, uh, you know, that is the number one way we see these adversaries take advantage of people is they, they put a link out there, uh, you know, for them to click on and to take advantage of. And I think another thing, when you think about privacy in these platforms, uh, you know, don't, don't put information in a Zoom chat, you know, in, in Dropbox or OneDrive that, that, you've, that probably doesn't need to be there. Uh, you know, think about the data you're transferring, how it's transferring out as well. So I'm sure we're going to, I know I'm, I'm doing a webinar in, in a couple of weeks uh, for BMSS, and I'm going to hit this Zoom topic probably head on. It seems to be the elephant in the room, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that during that, that seminar as well because uh, I, I do think it is at the top of a lot of people's mind. <clears throat> um, let's see, we've got some other questions here. Um, one person says, how do I buy Zoom? Uh, you know, Zoom offers a lot of different uh, applications and platforms. They have the phone, they have the Zoom conferencing. Uh, get in touch with us. We can uh, make sure you're looking at the right product. Uh, you can also give us their website. So they have a lot of information there. I know we've, we've been using their stuff for a, a while and they've been very helpful with us. Pretty easy to get started with them. Uh, but if you want to use them, hey, let us help you configure it and make your secure. I think that's one thing you can do. Um, uh, this is a good question. Should we be working to have all of our software to the cloud? So we got some clients working in the cloud, Lee. What, what are some advantages you see of working in the cloud? Oh, man, there's a lot of advantages of working in the cloud. One, you don't have the overhead of hardware to maintain, uh, keep under support. Um, you, you don't have a lot of wasted hardware or, you know, CPU power that, uh, you know, you buy what you need. And if you need more, you turn it up. If you need less, you turn it down. You really just yeah. pay for what you use or what you need. That's, that's one of the big beauties of it. And it's all centralized out there in the cloud. 
for you. All of a sudden, uh, working remote is very, very more feasible than it would be if everything's hosted on prem at your office. Um, those are two big advantages, I, I think. People don't realize until you know they get this big quote to replace their infrastructure. You know that they have to they have to do every five five years uh, roughly. So you kind of eliminate that and spread that out. Uh, over the over the lifetime uh, of your environment, so uh, those are some of the biggest things or biggest advantages I, I believe for for going hosted or in the cloud. Yeah, I see scalability being the biggest thing. Absolutely. You know, we we've we've seen uh, you know clients who go to a hosting environment uh, for their infrastructure uh, to see <clears throat> to they can scale out very quickly if they need to. Um, you know, we talk about software in the cloud. I think it some of that's going to depend on line of business software because we've seen we've had good experiences and bad with that uh you know a lot of people use quickbooks i use quickbooks on premise for a long long time we moved to quickbooks on cloud can't say it was you know the best thing but it, it works pretty well it's secure uh so i do think you have to evaluate uh not just your i think infrastructure is one evaluation you know what do you have apps that run your business line of business apps that are available in the cloud through your vendor, can you move that with your infrastructure to the cloud? Um, you know, I think there's there's some no-brainers there. I think email, I, I think that's one of the things that, uh, you know, I don't think we can say there's anybody who's going to benefit from really having that Exchange server on site. That seems to be a, a pretty, uh, you know, easy decision for most clients to make, most companies to make, is move their email out, um, you know, out into a cloud provider. We, we use Office 365. There's some others out there, but... Uh, I think it needs to be part of your overall strategy as a company, uh, but I do need to think you, you definitely need to evaluate, you know, each piece of it to see, well, what makes sense and also what's available out there for you uh, to make that jump to the cloud. I do think you're going to see more of that happening, uh, you know, on the, on the back end of the quarantine and the reaction to the pandemic. Uh, people, uh, I think more companies are going to want flexibility uh, with their workforce and the best way they're going to get that is is by looking to, uh, you know, the cloud solutions and and what's offered there. <clears throat> yeah, from a technical standpoint, too, you know, like Brian kind of mentioned, it gives you so much more flexibility. To, yeah. To do what you want to do, um, you know, if you need to spin three servers up and, and get rid of them three months later, it is what it is. It's it's not that big of a deal to where if you had to buy three physical servers or another virtual host to, to, you know, provide that. And then all of a sudden you don't need them anymore. Uh, well, you've got all this wasted hardware and compute power just, just sitting there. So um, yeah, it's, it's very efficient. I, w I would say so as well. And uh, this is a great question. I think uh, one, you know, it seems like a working environment is going to change going forward. Uh, what are some tips you have to help us change the way we work? It's a broad question. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think there's a tech, there's definitely a technology piece to it. Uh, you know, what are some things we, I know you talk to a lot of clients about, you know, we get this question about, Hey, well, I've got some people who want to work from home. You know, what are some things you tell them? What are, what are some things you, you recommend to them, Lee? Uh, some, like some of the things we've already touched up on. Uh, we need, they need to have an inventory of what machines are going to be used to mm -hmm. access the, the network. You know, they need to make sure it follows, his, follows their policies, work policies. They need to make sure, you know, that also the software is audited on there. And make sure, you know, niece or nephew is over there installing a bunch of games yeah. or browsing <laughs> the web. You know, it needs to be used for that user and that user only, just like the office computer would. Um, gosh, you know, the, there's, the, it's, it's a long list. I don't even know where to start. Those are some of the big ones. But um, like we well, said... It's got to be patched and up to date, you know, kind of yeah. really what we already talked about before. I don't want to be. I, I think if we, if we, yeah, if, if you, I think if you're a company, you know, looking, you know, how's this going to change the way we work? Well, I think one is, uh, it's probably going to change how we look at working remotely. Uh, I think, um, uh, number one, I think when you just look at the, you know, the, the computer and the PC, you know, is it going to be a, you know, a, we, we recommend clients use, you know, Hey, get your, if you, if you want your people to work from home, get them a laptop. That's probably the easiest answer. Uh, I think if it's going to be more of a long-term thing, I think you got to look at desktop as a service. It gives you the flexibility access, 
a cloud-based infrastructure from pretty much any device, and, it's, and it can be done securely. And for people uh, that might not know what desktop as a service is, you want to fill them in on that real quick? Yeah, uh, really desktop as a service, you think about when you log on to your machine now, you get a certain experience, uh, but it's, it's local to that machine. Uh, desktop as a service is basically your desktop, you know, as you may use it now, but it's hosted in the cloud. So you basically would open a web browser, you'd log onto a page, and then you'd be presented with what would be your desktop. Uh, and it allows you to access uh, your applications, your email, uh, you know, on your computer, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a corporate computer. It can be any device. You can access it through uh, an iPad or a tablet device. Uh, you know, if you really get in a pinch, you could probably do it on your phone, although that would be a very small screen. Uh, but it gives you a lot of flexibility as far as accessing your network uh, because your network isn't necessarily down the street. It, it's hosted in a data center uh, where it can be secured. And plus, we can wrap, around, wrap MFA around that. We can wrap VPN and secure connectivity around that. Uh, I think it is definitely a good long-term solution. And also, you don't necessarily have to have a, a super powerful laptop to make it happen either. I mean, it could be just a basic machine. Um, I think some things about, you know, changing the way we work, I think that is, that's a, this is a big question there because I don't know. How do you feel like for work? We've worked, we've been working from home, what, almost three weeks now. How do you feel about it? How's it working for you? I, yeah, I like it. You know, I, you know, before this happened, I was a big proponent of everybody go to the office, you know, old school kind of just the way it's always been. And this is really going to change things. You know, we've all been at home and, you know, I find that I have less distractions. Some people may not find that it might, you know, yeah, it might not work for everybody, but uh, there's definitely the tool set out there to make it happen to where people can work from anywhere and they're not expensive tools. So it's, it's definitely going to change moving forward. Uh, younger generation, you know, I think is going to be all for it. I think it's the, the, old sticklers like me that in the past, you know, it's kind of opened my eyes like, wow, I can work from home and be just as efficient, if not more efficient in some cases. So yeah, it's definitely going to change. Uh, I think we're going to see uh, a whole new tool set. Wait and watch. Yeah. There's going to be a whole new tool set for working from home coming They're They're not out yet, but they're coming and it'll only make it that much more easier. And I think, you know, uh, uh, desktop as a service and cloud hosting and stuff like that. I think it's really going to take off and be beneficial. Um, yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, I worked from home, I think for the first, you know, time at length was about 11 years ago, uh, when my son was born and I worked at home for almost two weeks straight. And, uh, I learned a lot about, you know, how that works. And we are, we are fortunately set up to do that. Uh, definitely not as good as we are now. I think we're set up better to do it with, with zoom and, and our phones and all that. But I think there's a couple of things you got to think about from a personal standpoint. Uh, you know, you almost have to treat it like your work day. I mean, I get up, I, I go almost through the same routine I do as if I was going into the office. I think that's important just from uh, a mental standpoint, from a productivity standpoint. Uh, you know, you really, although you're, you're, you're working from home, you can't let that change your routine a whole lot. Uh, you need to stay in that routine as much as possible. I think too, you got to have it. You got to have an environment at home that you can work in. Uh, you know, I'm fortunate enough. My wife allowed me to, to come downstairs in our basement and use her desk that she had. I usually work uh, in the living room and that's just, that's hard to do right now. Uh, at least for a long period of time. So I think you, you have to have a, a dedicated environment uh, to work from home. And, and, and it does minimize distractions in the home uh, as much as you can. But also, I think it adds to your productivity. I also think you have to take breaks. Uh, and I have found working from home, I actually work longer hours. I spend more time in here because I don't have that barrier between, you know, leaving and my commute is missing it's not there and that and you don't realize how important that commute really is but it is it is important uh you know it's, it's a great time to decompress we also don't have that either uh so we, we've had some conversations with our techs and you know trying to work through some of that because it it is it can be a, a difficult transition but i do think there's a lot of technical aspects to it but there's also a lot of personal and mental aspects to it as well that uh, you need to need to find you're going to, have to find some ways to decompress. 
uh, because I just walk upstairs and there's my family <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and I, 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 how do you, how do you segregate and Hey, how do you keep work at work and home at home? It's a little bit hard to do in this environment. So, so I, I would say, you know, outside the technical stuff, you know, having a dedicated machine, having secure connection, Hey, you know, keep your routine, keep your routine going, you know, take some breaks, go outside, walk around a little bit. Uh, you know, you need to have that, and, you know, try to, to, to have a good environment that you can uh, work from home with, uh, you know, and have a good setup, you know, have a, have a dedicated workspace uh, and be honest with yourself about the time you spend down there. You know, don't, you know, turn it off, you know, go spend time with your family, especially right now in the times we're facing. So, there are some tips I have, you know, that, that this definitely changes yeah. the way we work. We do a lot more zoom meetings and uh, you know, I think I've done more zoom meetings here in the last three weeks and I probably have done in my entire lifetime. <laughs> so uh, a big thing there. I keep, I keep in mind too, you know, some days are going to be better than others. So, they are. You're not going to have, you know, a hundred percent productivity, just a great day. Some of them, some of them are going to be harder to stay on task or stay focused. That's, just the nature of the beast so and get frustrated with one day and one thing we've done one too is we 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 had uh we had team lunches that we used to have and now we have a zoom team lunch so it was good to just get online with your co-workers and uh you know still have some of that interaction with them so i think that's that's pretty important as well uh here's a good question i've been told to watch out for covid 19 scams how do these scams work uh any thoughts on that Gosh, I haven't run across any, but you know, the government's not going to reach out to you to do something. So uh, they kind of wait for you to reach out to them, but I haven't run across any scams personally. Um, so I'm not really up to speed on them. You know, I know they're out there, but they definitely are. You know, people are going to reach out to help. You have to, they'll, they'll put it out there and you got to go get it. So just, just be aware of what you're doing. Take the time to do some research to see if it's even something that's legitimately real or, you know, if they, you know, text messages and emails and stuff like that with links in them. They're not going to, that's, that's yeah. not the way they're going to go about helping you out. So those are red flags immediately. Yeah. I, I think overall, we know phishing emails happen every day, all day long. I get them all the time. Uh, you know, and then I think with the COVID-19, you know, you're seeing probably a lot of adversaries trying to exploit that situation specifically. Um, I was involved. I, I, I get some uh, bulletins from the FBI and some other threat intelligent places. And what I saw was I think between uh, within like a seven day period, late March, there were just thousands of domains registered for either coronavirus, COVID-19, you know, some kind of variation of that. And they're buying these domains for one of two reasons, one to host a malicious website or two to use as the for originating phishing emails. And, and so, you know, the adversaries are looking for ways to take advantage of the situation and, and they're trying to do it and they're probably doing it successfully in some places uh, as well. I think some of the ones I saw specifically were emails from CDC, emails from world world health organization were some two that we saw come out and they look good. Uh, you know, they were, they were great representations. They had the logos, they had the, the privacy notifications, you know, whoever was putting those together did a great job of putting them together and make them look legitimate. Uh, but, but, you know, when you think about it, the World Health Organization doesn't know who Brian Jackson is. Why would I be getting an email from them? I have no idea. And I definitely would not trust a link that I get in that scenario. So a lot of red flags there when you think about when you get emails from that. Uh, another uh, angle or threat vector we saw, I've seen and heard of is, uh, you know, either some kind of, of testing related to COVID-19, uh, some type of cure, therapy, you know, anything along that lines that are just, you know, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is type of scams. And, and we, we have seen those come across as well. This, and that's really just trying to get people's money, I think, and trying to, to extort money off of them. But I also see a second wave. And that has to do specifically with SBA loans and funding programs that have come out as well. I see those as really being a, a high threat environment. I think businesses, as they start wanting to take advantage of those programs, they really need to be careful about how they, uh, you know, access that, about emails they get regarding those programs. 
uh, you know, for two reasons. One, uh, almost there's a lot of businesses out there that are, they're participating in them, uh, because we, we're all sort of, uh, under stress right now. Our businesses are facing stress. We've seen a lot of the economic numbers. Uh, but two, you know, during the application process for these loans, uh, and for the PPP program, you have to put in bank account information you have to put in routing information and, and that, those two pieces of information could give someone direct access to your bank account. And, and you definitely don't want them to have that information. Um, also on the personal side with the stimulus that the IRS and are, is being distributed through the IRS channel, you know, they're, they're going to have websites soon that allow you to put in your personal banking and information to have that money direct deposited to you. And, be very, very careful about, uh, you know, those websites, uh, you know, where you're visiting, make sure you're going to, you know, rs.gov or sba.gov, uh, be very aware of any emails that you may get, uh, you know, from or about those programs. So uh, I think COVID-19 on itself was one thing where we saw, you know, an initial, uh, series of scams out there. And then uh, now we're seeing probably a second hit about that through the SBA.gov and SBA loans. So um, anything, anything else to add about that? Anything you've seen beyond that? Nope. Just be careful. You know, yes. And scams are out there. So. Well, I'm going to take, we're, we're about at the one hour mark. So I'm going to take a few minutes just to wrap up here. Uh, with a couple of things, a couple of closing thoughts here. Um, I think, you know, one thing is, you know, if you have people working from home uh, and your, your remote force is, uh, you know, is remote, uh, be, you know, talk to them, communicate to them, you know, as leaders in our businesses, we need to have an open line of communication with them, need to check in on them, uh, you know, talk to them about the security, you know, let them know about the dangers out there. You know, if we can help out in any way, I'd be happy to, to jump on a Zoom call or, or do something on this format with them. Have no problem with doing that. I think uh, it is an us first them mentality. You know, we, we want to make sure that uh, we don't want to see anyone get taken advantage of, uh, especially uh, in this environment. Um, I do think there's some trends that are going to come out of this. And I think it could, uh, you know, affect the way we all conduct business, but also the way we work. And uh, really advise, you know, you know, in your business, start thinking you know, before thinking about that, you know, on the other side of this, what is, is it going to change your business? Is there going to be new technologies that you may uh, want to look at uh, and also uh, want to participate in uh, to get your uh, business better prepared? And I think lastly, uh, just to wrap up, you know, think about, uh, you know, business continuity, think about disaster recovery. Uh, I know this is the first pandemic I've seen in my lifetime but, uh, you know, it could be something else tomorrow. Uh, we'll look at the, the severe weather and the tornadoes that have hit, uh, you know, so it's sort of, you know, it affects your business. So, you know, as leaders in our business, you know, have a plan, you know, figure out what that plan is and, uh, you know, how you can continue doing business in spite or, uh, you know, in spite of any kind of challenges with either, you know, severe weather or now, hey, we're facing this pandemic. So, uh, I think there's a lot of work for us to do out there as, as the leaders of our business and with our companies. And we need to start thinking about things like this, uh, some of those topics uh, going forward. So, uh, I, just, just to wrap up to you, I would consider all the companies review their remote work policies. And if they don't have yes. one, consider getting one um, written up as soon as possible. Uh, IT can't solve all problems. So there are place, uh, there is a place for policies for that. Um, just, just keep that in mind. And if you don't have a policy, I would really consider uh, you getting one. Mm -hmm. Feel free to consult us. Um, we, we've written several in the past. So Yeah, I think a disaster recovery, business continuity, and now, <laughs> hey, remote access policy needs to be added to that. So, well, uh, we're going to wrap up. I want to thank everyone for, uh, you know, attending our Q&A session today. Uh, we had some really good questions. Uh, very pleased to see that, uh, you know, as far as, uh, you know, as, as panelists and, and hopefully the information we discussed today was beneficial to you. Uh, we're going to start having more webinars in the future. Uh, hopefully our goal is to have two or three a month. Some will be Q&A like this. Some we're going to cover a topic. 
uh, that maybe or what we hope is going to be, uh, you know, something would be important to you. So, uh, so we're going to wrap up. I want to thank everyone for attending. Hope you, uh, your family stays healthy. Hope your, uh, your business uh, continues to thrive even in this environment. So, and if anyone uh, would like to, to follow up or, or get in touch with Lee or I to further discuss any of these items, uh, feel free to do so. You can uh, email us at, uh, you know, support at abacustechnologies.com and that will make, we'll make sure it gets to either me or him and we'll reach out to you and, uh, and talk about more. Uh, talk talk through any of this else with you if you need to. So, hope everyone has a good day. We're going to end the meeting now, and uh, please stay uh, stay healthy, uh, stay safe. Thanks, Thanks everybody for attending.